We are live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters at 731 Lexington Avenue. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, pre-Fed jitters and an SEC investigation into Coinbase putting a dent in the crypto rebound. We'll speak with Kristen Smith of the Blockchain Association. And we'll meet the cryptocurrency critic who says the whole system should die in a fire. That's a quote. Nicholas Weaver, a computer computer scientist at Berkeley and Scary Technologies is ahead. And shunning Sam Bankman free, bankrupt Voyager Digital dismisses the 30-year-old billionaire's offer as a low-ball bid dressed up as a white knight rescue. All of that is ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of the market. Your best way to see that on the Bloomberg terminal is CRYP Go. That is your function, but no surprise given it is a risk off day and we're looking forward to another Federal Reserve hike tomorrow. Cryptocurrencies are being weighed down quite hard. Bitcoin right now down more than 5%. We are back south of the $21,000 level and the pain is more pronounced for Ether and Solana, which are down 9% and 9 each uh, roughly. And of course, Coinbase, Matt mentioned this, it already was down in tandem with other crypto related equities given the move lower we are seeing in the digital currencies themselves. But double on that, the SEC investigation, the Bloomberg scoop that they are looking into whether or not some of those digital assets should have been listed as securities. So Coinbase is down a whopping 15 percent, now down about 78 percent on a year-to-date basis, Matt. Yeah, Coinbase getting absolutely clobbered. And Bitcoin um, obviously feeling that heat. We had a pretty good uh, couple of weeks for Bitcoin. You can see here that we saw some almost 10 percent gains in last week. Now we're giving up those gains as the drumbeat in Washington for U.S. regulators to do more to oversee crypto has grown louder. SEC Chair Gary Gensler, who's long argued that many digital assets fall under his jurisdiction, spoke exclusively with Bloomberg last week. There's a lot of non-compliance, meaning like if you raise money from the public and, and that public is anticipating based on your efforts, uh, some profit, that comes into the securities laws. Gensler and his colleagues now want to know if Coinbase listed digital assets that were actually securities. Lydia Bayoud, who helped break this Bloomberg scoop, joins us now. So Lydia, why uh, is the SEC investigating Coin Coinbase? What were these securities? So it seems like uh, the SEC has been looking into Coinbase and whether or not it's listed some uh, tokens that should have been registered as securities for quite some time. It predates an insider trading case that the SEC uh, brought last week that involved a, a former Coinbase employee. Um, and, you know, the SEC hasn't identified which of the tokens are specifically under scrutiny here, but our reporting with my colleague Ali Verspril indicates that this really ratcheted up when Coinbase started listing a lot more assets on the platform. Well, and of course, that raises the question of which, which assets are the ones that are supposed to be securities. The SEC kind of needs to define that here, of course. But why are they focused so much on regulating these crypto exchanges in particular, Lydia? Well, I think when you're the securities uh, regulator, you view everything through that prism. Um, Gary Gensler, the SEC chairman, whose interview we had on Bloomberg last week, touched on uh, his view that most of these assets in the crypto space are securities. Um, you know, if they decide to pursue some sort of enforcement action with Coinbase that could really bring to a head in court, uh, potentially, whether or not whichever of these tokens that they're focusing in on are actually securities. All right, Bloomberg's Lydia Bayoud, thank you so much. And joining us now to continue this conversation is Kristen Smith, Executive Director of the Blockchain Association. She serves as a liaison between policymakers and the crypto industry to assist in the creation of legislation and regulation. So Kristen, we know we have a lot of conversation about regulation. This is just another layer in that the SEC looking into Coinbase. It raises the question of defining what is a security, what is a commodity, who has control over what? I mean, how far away are we really from getting those answers and those that guidance finalized? Yeah, this is a debate that has been going on for years in Washington, and I think it's one of the biggest outstanding questions that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, the laws around determining what a security 
are is very complex. In the United States, unlike anywhere else in the world, we have this investment contract, which is defined by nothing but a Supreme Court case uh, that was considered back in 1946. So it's really not easy to apply this test to crypto assets to determine whether or not there is security. I think what was frustrating about the news this week with the insider trading case is it sort of randomly declared that these nine tokens are securities without any reasoning as to how the SEC believes that or thinks that. So it sends a lot of confusion to the marketplace um, when there is a clear analysis about what to do. And I think it's really important that you know, Congress has looked at this issue, right? They want to opine on this. They want to try to find a pathway forward. And I think instead of doing this regulation by enforcement, we should be looking at the legislative process. We should be looking at the open executive order uh, research and study that's going on right now uh, to really think through this from a public policy perspective, to find the right way to make sure that there's consumer protection, make sure that the markets have integrity, uh, but also provide an environment with clarity that allows for this technology to be developed here in the U.S. Kristen, why do you think uh, the SEC, Gary Gensler, why are they being so opaque? Why not be more transparent? Is there a political aspect to this? You know, it's really it's really unclear, other than I think, you know, sort of as Lydia was discussing before, like when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? I mean, this is the uh, this is what they do. They regulate. The only power they have to get over this market is if these assets are indeed securities. And so, you know, it's it's um, hard to hard to know their motivation. But I think one one thing that would help is if we find an appropriate market regulator, if we create a new regime for these crypto markets, um, I think there's going to be uh, less pressure there to deem them securities because the markets will be regulated right. and there will be minimum standards of disclosure. Well, so that, I think that's a role for Congress, not for the SEC. Yeah. And it seems like something that just isn't going to happen. Can we at least say that Bitcoin is not a security? Yes, I think that's pretty clear, uh, both because um, the CFTC has said that and um, I believe Gary Gensler has said that himself. And so, yeah, Bitcoin, um, there's no Bitcoin company, right? Um, there's no, nobody even knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. There's, there's no uh, one individual uh, or organization that could file paperwork uh, to register Bitcoin. So I, I think Bitcoin is safe. But, um, you know, beyond that, the SEC hasn't indicated you know, which of these tokens are securities or not, other right. than to say, you know, a vast majority of them are securities. So, Kristen, that raises the question, could Coinbase have avoided this? And how do other companies avoid it in the future if there is no clarity on which which asset is supposed to be a security? Well, you know, exchanges, um, you know, like Coinbase and other exchanges have incredibly thorough vetting processes for listing tokens on their platforms. They look through all of the 2019 guidance that the SEC issued to, to help try to figure out how to apply this, this Howey test, the Supreme Court test, to digital assets. Uh, you know, they, help, they work with white shoe law firms. They uh, have former people from the SEC on their staff internally, and they work very hard to make a call as to whether or not something is a security or not. But but that's that's the only tool available to them. And, you know, I think that if a token makes it that far in the process that, you know, they have a strong conviction that it's not a security, um, but there's no no clear way. Uh, it's it's a it's a big problem. There's there's a lot of time and money and effort that goes into figuring it out. And if there were just a better, clearer, simpler way to to apply these rules, I don't think we would have these problems. So Kristen, obviously when Gary Gensler has homed in on these trading platforms, he's talked a lot about protecting retail, protecting mom and pop. What are the best decisions, how do you regulate to protect retail investors? What does that even look like? Well, you know, I think one of the most important things is to have an appropriate disclosure regime. And the SEC deals with a lot of disclosures. There's a lot of filings about, you know, publicly traded companies and things of that nature. The problem is crypto networks have very different kinds of qualities that will determine and influence whether or not it's a good uh, token to buy, right? Um, if you have uh, a, a crypto network, the, the success of the network often has to do with the number of developers who are working on that mm. network. It has to do with the applications, the number of nodes on the network. This, this doesn't 
um, you know, this, this doesn't fall in line with like the balance sheet of the company that might be working on it. it. It's just a fundamentally different set of data. So we need to have thoughtful, tailored disclosures um, around how to do this, but the disclosure might not come from a team of developers who are building the code. It might come from the exchange or some other entity, but this is a debate that needs to be had. And, and we're happy that Congress is having these conversations. And we are optimistic that we can get legislation done next year. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, to have this regulation by enforcement is not, uh, it, it's not productive. It, it's not helping provide more clarity, more guidance. It's really just adding, adding confusion. Kristen, we're going to talk with Nicholas Weaver next. I'm sure you know him. He hopes the entire crypto universe dies in the fire. Um, what, what do you say to fight back against his concerns and many people's concerns that proof of work uh, mining wastes far too much energy? Well, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding around the numbers of proof of work mining, but I think that there's actually a really good story to tell on the climate front with mining. I mean, if you go down to Texas right now, there are wind farms that are being co-located with Bitcoin mining because it actually makes the deployment of new renewable energy sources profitable. And so I think, you know, we need to step back and have a broader conversation here. Yes, proof of work uses energy, that, that there's no question there, but it really is uh, helping to incentivize the, the deployment of renewable energy. And I think, um, you know, it can be part of the solution, not, not, not driving the problem. Kristen, thanks so much for joining us. Kristen Smith there from the Blockchain Association, where she is executive director. We're going to talk about that more coming up. A Ponzi scheme composed of Ponzi schemes is what Nicholas Weaver calls them. We're going to speak with the crypto critic and computer security expert um, from Scary Technologies. Plus, we'll talk Sam Bankman-Fried's crypto empire and why the billionaire's latest target may be tough to acquire. Plus, to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CR. RYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. I think the worst happened, and now we're rebuilding the fundamentals of Bitcoin and any viable investment thesis. Uh, hasn't changed. 24-7 settling, the ability to interact at a retail level and not have to go through intermediaries. This market is here to stay and it's going to grow like crazy. We had the forced selling, that's the most pain. There's no more forced selling. It's going to be really interesting to see if Bitcoin rallies when others don't in like six to 12 months. I think we'll see the emergence of identity solutions, risk management solutions, and a bunch of exciting stuff that will make the whole ecosystem feel safer. People aren't going to give up on crypto. How healthy the ecosystem is in the long run is going to be a very strong predictor of you know how much we can grow. That was some of the Bloomberg Crypto Summit panelists staying optimistic on digital assets. Joining us now is notable crypto critic for The Other View. Nicholas Weaver is a researcher from the UC Berkeley's International Computer Science Institute and chief mad scientist at Scary Technologies. Yes, that is his real title. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us. You have been quoted multiple times as saying that the cryptocurrency system should die in a fire. Why? So let's split out two factors, the technology and the economics. From a technological standpoint, there's no innovation. It's basically repackaging stuff we've seen for decades with a few innovations that just make things worse. So like cryptocurrency mining burns, what, half a percent of the world's electricity. And yet, how many transactions can Bitcoin perform? three to seven transactions per second worldwide. The technology is so bad, I can only teach it to mock it. Doesn't um, Lightning solve that? No, because the Lightning Network can only add three to seven users per second on a worldwide basis, because any Lightning transaction to create a channel, refund a channel, or close a channel requires a Bitcoin transaction. So Lightning does not solve the problem. How the problem gets solved is what uh, the Shiva wallet did, where you just update entries in a central database like any other payment system. Nicholas, I, uh, first of all, I love your arguments and I've read a lot of your stuff and watched your videos. But 
we do have a fundamental problem as demonstrated by, you know, the U.S. cutting off Russia from the global dollar system. Now, from our perspective, that's great, right? Because they're the bad guys. But from their perspective, it would be nice to have a, a monetary system without an intermediary that can't cut them off. Or for any freedom fighter um, that's working under an authoritarian government, you want something like that, right? It's not just about paying drug dealers. So, Except that they have that. So when you're in a country which has unstable things, the U.S. exports a lot of these uh, little green pieces of paper with dead white dudes on them. And <laughs> the European Union exports a lot of pieces of plastic with um, fake architecture on them. And that's what gets used in those environments. And really, but th no, that's what I, exactly what I'm talking about. So um, Russia was just es essentially cut off from that dollar system. I mean, you don't want to carry around, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in a duffel bag to pay, um, you know, your to bond pay your payments, ransom payments to make your bond so payments. I, I understand that there are other things that are more illicit, but from their perspective, they would prefer to have a system with no intermediaries. Except that the no intermediary system does not scale. That three to seven transactions per second worldwide. That's the hard limit yeah. on these systems. But as important, they don't actually work for payments if the payments would be processed by the normal system because of the volatility. The price is always bouncing up and down. And when we actually look at the economics, it's effectively a self-assembled Ponzi scheme. So I'm a savvy investor. And by savvy investor, it means I put my money in index funds and ignore it for a couple of decades. <laughs> now, this is a positive sum game. When I eventually sell my index funds, um, both stock and bonds, my gains are not just due to what somebody else will pay for it, but also the gains from dividends and interest payments and the like. Right. And that makes it Nicholas. positive sum. If I could just ask you, you talk a lot about the proof of work system, how it's inefficient, how it uses a lot of energy, but then you have Ethereum, for example, which when the merge takes place, we think in the next couple of months is going to move to a proof of stake system in which you can see a lot more transactions processed per second, in which energy use in theory is going to go down. So are you talking about proof of work systems separately from proof of stake? Because that's not the entire no. crypto ecosystem dying in a fire. No, the proof of so first of all, economically, it is a self-assembled Ponzi scheme, and that alone would be enough. But proof of stake doesn't solve these problems. So first of all, Ethereum has been promising proof of stake since basically they started, and it's always been six months out. So um, first of all, wake me up when the transition happens. <laughs> Secondly, when you look at the uh, the throughput of the system, that's unaffected by the proof of work, proof of stake. So the Ethereum global computer can process a whopping three to seven transactions per, or no, sorry, that's Bitcoin. The Ethereum global computer from a processing viewpoint is one five thousandth this little Raspberry Pi compute module. Um, the compute module itself is 35 bucks. Um, shifting to uh, proof of stake doesn't solve that problem. And it also creates another problem of he who has the gold makes the rules. Yes. That the Ethereum community has already shown that their mantra of code is law is a lie. That if you steal their money, such as the original DAO hack, they will change the code to steal it back. Yeah. And switching to proof of stake literally says those who have the most money make the rules. And is that a viable system? Yeah, that's a conversation Matt and I have had many times on this program. Nicholas Weaver, thank you so much for joining us to add your voice to the conversation. Make sure to come back and visit us soon. And of course, be sure to check out our Bloomberg Crypto podcast, which dives deeper than the daily market buzz to explore how this asset class is changing the way we live. Look for that every week through the Bloomberg Professional app, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. This is Bloomberg. It's okay to do a deal that is moderately bad. Right. 
in, in bailing out a place. Like the bar was not, this is a good return on investment. The bar is like, this is not that bad of a return on investment, or like we are incinerating a relatively small-ish amount of money in doing this. When the assets and the liabilities are like roughly the same number, and you can imagine someone saying, look, here's the outstanding uncertainties we have. It is plus or minus 20 million, depending on those uncertainties, right? That's the place where it's sort of like most obvious that we should act, because if we don't, they might be slightly underwater, and there are serious questions about like, do they have to take drastic corporate action? But for like a relatively small, um, you know, sort of like potential incineration of money, we can like resolve that problem and make them able to like continue operating and like carry on and not like cause contagion or customers losing assets or anything like that. That was FTX co-founder and CEO Sam Bankman-Fried speaking at the Bloomberg Crypto Summit last week. And of course, the crypto billionaire has been using the $2 trillion crypto route to carry out a deal-making spree. His latest target, however, looks a little less certain. Crypto platform Voyager Digital has called the offer from FTX, quote, a low-ball bid dressed up as a white knight rescue. Hannah Miller, Bloomberg Crypto reporter, joins us now um, to explain that. Hannah, so... Um, I thought he was the, the lifeline to Voyager, and now they kind of spit in his face. What's the story? Yeah, no, Voyager is not happy with what they call a lowball offer. Um, they think it's just kind of a publicity stunt that he's using to generate goodwill within the industry and that he's disrupting the bankruptcy process. They see all the advantages here for FTX and Alameda, not for Voyager. Well, and you talk about kind of that reputation. Why is there some resentment concerning that white knight image? I think the crypto industry is at a crossroads right now um, with Sam Bankman fried consol consolidating power. Uh, some people really resent the fact that he's stepping in, you know, buying up companies, bailing people out, gaining control over an industry that is supposed to be decentralized. Other people see him as crypto's patron saint who's really helping out. How much money has S SBF made and how much does he still have after the crypto crash? Yes, his fortune is estimated to be around $10 billion. That's about half of where it was in April. Uh, he has pledged to give most of this personal wealth away, and he is still passionate about making deals within the industry. He said last week that he's willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars more on supporting crypto. Yeah, I guess his version of a small amount of cash lit on fire isn't exactly the same as the rest of ours. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Hannah Miller. That's going to wrap it up for Bloomberg Crypto this week. But you can join us again next week, same time, same place, 1 p.m. Eastern time every Tuesday right here on Bloomberg Television. This is Bloomberg.